This point is where things take a vicious and evil turn. When I say evil, I don't mean some nebulous definition. Critical race theory post-2010 devours people. It takes advantage of the average person's common decency and desire to do good and warps it into advocacy for whatever they want. Let me make it very clear that I do not advocate for harm to come to the people who push for CRT and its related ideologies. Of course, I do want justice for them whenever they step out of line, but the traditional correct definition of justice, not the warped, corrupted, neo-Marxist idea of justice. You will see shortly why I claim that these ideas are evil. It's the evil ideas that must be abolished, not the people. In 2010, while microaggressions were being toyed with by Daryl Dwing Su, Barbara Applebaum was foisting her writings upon the world with a hideous book titled Being White, Being Good, White Complicity, White Moral Responsibility, and Social Justice Pedagogy. You can kind of get an idea of the whole book just from the title. All white people are infected with racism. Racism meaning power and prejudice, by the way. The relevant point for now is that all white people are racist or complicit by virtue of benefiting from privileges that are not something they can voluntarily renounce. Applebaum cited Charles Mill's racial contract argument, claiming that all white people conspire against all non-whites all the time. They aim to keep a permanent grasp of power and create a permanent subclass of non-whites apparently. White privilege protects and supports white moral standing. All whites are responsible for white dominance since their very being depends on it. One thing used to perpetuate the system is white ignorance. To achieve the racial contract, there is a need to perpetuate ignorance and to misinterpret the world as it really is. Whites aim to stay rooted in the master-slave dialectic from all those years back, apparently. In her words, the racial contract is an officially sanctioned reality that is divergent from actual reality. One has an agreement to misinterpret the world. But her idea of reality truly stems from the mind of Hegel, who didn't believe material reality was all that important, so she exists in a contradiction. But that's not a problem for postmodernism. Next comes the white savior of all repressed minorities, Robin D'Angelo, in 2011. Her gigantically popular book, White Fragility, garnered global attention and made her millions of dollars. Many years prior, Judith Katz had wanted multiculturalism to be more widespread and wanted all races and their cultures to be perfectly balanced. Her concessions to the white race are gone in D'Angelo's work. In fact, she says, A positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. Again, she emphasizes that discrimination takes place unconsciously, but as Chester Pierce before her was searching high and low for racism, she says that most discrimination happens that way. More than this, even saying, we don't discriminate, I'm racially colorblind, or I treat everyone equally, just serve to stand in the way of real racial justice. This is what they call white talk. These attitudes turn a blind eye to the true reality and allow unconscious discrimination to continue unabated. She also makes a distinction between diversity as it was commonly known and critical diversity. In practice, diversity is not a variety of perspectives formed by various experiences being brought together. No, diversity really refers to people who, though they have different backgrounds, all have the correct politics. Diversity of race means diversity of people who understand their place in the system of prejudice and oppression. This awakened state is again called critical consciousness. Next, in 2012, D'Angelo published her worst book called Is Everyone Really Equal? In it, she changes the idea of minority from a noun into a verb. People can be minoritized or oppressed by the power system domination of white hegemony. Furthermore, a collection of people of the same race is never benign. There is always some form of exclusion going on. Common sense would tell us that because we do not believe in discrimination, we do not engage in it. However, most discrimination is unconscious and takes place whether we intend to discriminate or not. D'Angelo advocated for seeing people not as individuals, but as members of key racial groups, since seeing people as racial groups allowed for seeing the patterns of structural injustice allegedly existent. To point out the relevance of our group memberships is to challenge a privilege to which we often feel entitled. The privilege to see ourselves and be seen by others as individuals outside of social groups. On the white side of things, if a white person gets defensive, as people often do when confronted, this isn't to be taken as a profession of innocence, but of guilt. This is known as the Kafka trap. Any claim of innocence must be used as proof of guilt. 
Their defensiveness sends an unwelcoming message to anyone else in the room who may want to engage constructively. Defensiveness in this context is an indication of a dominant worldview, and it functions to protect that worldview rather than expand it, lower any defensiveness you may be feeling. Importantly, she admits that many critical social justice movements started out peacefully, but turned to reject individualism, peace, and even freedom. They don't want free speech. They want a boot on your face forever. Many of these movements initially advocated for a type of liberal humanism, individualism, freedom, and peace, but quickly turned to a rejection of liberal humanism. A couple more terms are relevant here. There is a racial scale of oppression. Whiteness is on top, and blackness is on bottom, permanently. Racism moves down the scale toward blacks, so black people can never be racist, and whites always are. Anyone being racist is participating in anti-blackness. Also, anyone of another race who sides at all with whiteness is accused of white adjacency, or the act of being too white. Much of this is affirmed in the 2013 Handbook of Critical Race Theory and Education, which defines progress not as a slow progress forward, but as a never-ending power struggle. Amazingly, things got worse. In 2016, Brianna Foz and Michael Carger published Women's Studies as a Virus. This is no joke. They compared women's studies, critical pedagogy, and similar ideologies to viruses, and did so favorably. AIDS, Ebola, SARS, and even cancer are listed as role models for women's studies. Viral attacks have been proposed to cause cancer, autoimmune disorders, and neurological disease. In this sense, the virus may work as a powerful metaphor for women's studies pedagogical practices. Rather than simply inducing harm among its victims, viruses can also represent transformative change. They even compare conservative movements like men's rights or post-feminism to a body's immune system and say that those need to be suppressed. These movements seek to essentially reaffirm the need for the patriarchal status quo. Collectively, these institutional and popular responses represent the corporate university's immune response to the imposition of the feminist virus. Anti-feminist, post-feminist, and men's rights organizations represent, metaphorically, the protective T-cells and cytokines that seek out and dismantle threatening critical pedagogical invaders. The students of women's studies need to go out and infect other industries like a virus would. In doing so, we frame two new priorities for women's studies training male students as viruses, and embracing negative stereotypes of feminist professors. In 2019, Ibram X. Kendi published both How to Be an Anti-Racist and Pass an Anti-Racist Constitutional Amendment. The former is famous for the idea that past discrimination is only fixed by present discrimination, and present discrimination is only fixed by future discrimination. But the focus here will be on the latter. Kendi asserts that the presence of inequality is evidence of racial policy, not people, policy. His amendment to the Constitution would permanently establish the Department of Anti-Racism to fix said policy. The DOA would oversee all federal, state, and local policy to ensure racism isn't present. Also, the amendment would make racism over a certain threshold and the racist thoughts of public officials illegal. To fix the original sin of racism, told you it was a Christian heresy, Americans should pass an anti-racist amendment to the U.S. Constitution that enshrines two guiding anti-racist principles. His misspelling, not mine. Racial inequity is evidence of racist policy, and the different racial groups are equals. The amendment would make unconstitutional racial inequity over a certain threshold, as well as racist ideas by public officials with racist ideas and public official clearly defined. 2019 also saw Kimberly Crenshaw appear again with her book, Seeing Race Again. In wonderful candor, Crenshaw said that meritocracy, a pillar of Western civilization, stood outside the system of power, and therefore it didn't support the racial revolution. This essay revisits the history of how critical race theory emerged as an intellectual response to colorblindness in the context of institutional struggles over the scope of equality and the content of legal education. Institutional actors from across the political spectrum embraced a gradualist strategy of integration of CRT into society, premised on the assumption that the colorblind meritocracy stood outside of the economic and racial power. A cursory reading of any of the post-2010 works mentioned here will reveal how blatantly they admit their craziness. CRT continued to push into all aspects of America, 
In 2019, the Southern Baptist Convention passed Resolution 9 at their annual convention, which, though it claimed the misuse of CRT was the problem, still allowed the use of CRT in SBC churches. In 2020, the state of Washington implemented CRT into government, a new and scary step. The state of Washington Office of Equity Task Force forged their final proposal for outlining their goals and duties. They blatantly claimed the desire to disrupt and dismantle the current American system of oppression. Their goal was to make equity work everyone's work, so no one is really safe from ideology. They also have a focus on inclusion and belonging. These words don't mean what they seem to mean to average people. Inclusion. The notion that an organization or system is welcoming to new populations and or identities. This new presence is not merely tolerated but expected to contribute meaningfully into the system. New populations and identities here are marginalized groups. Toleration refers to repressive tolerance, so supporting strictly leftist policies and people. Inclusion is therefore the welcoming in of decidedly Marxist or leftist ideologues. From Pragya Agrawal in Belonging in the Workplace, A New Approach to Diversity and Inclusivity, the intention is not to focus on trying to hire people who will fit into workplace culture or support the employee in fitting into existing workplace culture at the cost of their own identity. The idea is not to ignore differences but to normalize how we discuss and talk about them. The idea is that everyone is different and they are equal. Inclusion and belonging were apparently needed to address racialized trauma in Washington. Marginalized groups needed to feel actively welcome, meaning that the goalposts will always be moved. Because how can you fully control someone's feelings of belonging from the outside? You can't.